Our interview today is with Mrs. Lurley McNeely at her home on Shin Farm Road. And uh, Mrs. McNeely is a longtime resident of the Prospect Presbyterian Church community. She also wrote an article for the Mortal Tribune for 25 years. And we are happy to be here today. Today is March 17, 2006, and she's going to relate for us stories about her life growing up here and her many experiences and things that she remembers about life in Mortal. Thank you, Ms. McNeely. And I know that you grew up as a farm girl, so tell us about that. Hello, yes, I am an old farm girl. And several of my doctors have told me, says, I can tell you're a farm girl because you're a toughie. So I, I guess that it does have some advantage being a toughie. But anyway, the Lord's blessed me in so many ways. Uh, growing up, of course, was a hard time for all families during the Depression. But we always had food and clothing. And, and most of all, it was so important that we go to church every Sunday. In other words, my father was so poor at one time, we couldn't afford a, a license tag for our car or buy gas. So we walked through the woods over to Prospect Church from Shin Farm Road. My daddy made us a foot log out of three trees across that creek so we wouldn't have to get our feet wet. Oh, I, I'm just full of all sorts of wonderful stories, but so thankful that I've had these experiences. And I have a lot of friends and a lot of loved ones, and it, it's a wonderful uh, life to appreciate what God has given us. Okay, now you worked for many, many years at Hillcrest County. Originally Cannon Mills. Tell us about some of the experiences working there. Uh, when I went to work at Cannon Mill, it was known as Cannon Mill. But soon after that, it changed to Fieldcrest Cannon. And Mr. Murdoch bought the, uh, the business. And as of now, the building is being torn down and making ready for a industrial laboratory. But anyway, it seemed as if, well, that's the best job I ever had in my life. They were, they were just so good to me. And my husband worked there for 45 years, and my grandfather worked there. My sister worked there, and two brothers also worked there. But it offered incomes to people that needed assistance. But anyway, the last year that I worked, I was nominated uh, as the senior, uh, as a textile citizen of the year. Uh, and I was a finalist in that judging and went to Raleigh. But I, um, of course, wasn't the one that got the title. But it was just an honor to be uh, honored that far. Uh, I retired in 89. And uh, I retired because my husband had already retired. And I was afraid if I didn't go ahead and retire that I might regret it if he got sick. Okay. Uh, we, as us, we also know that you wrote uh, articles about the Prospect community for the Mortal Tribune. Tell us about some of the things that you uh, recall from that. And also from, from growing up in Mortal in, 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 in the Mortal community area. Uh, well, I think one of the biggest thrills was everybody looked forward to going into town on Saturday evening. We worked like everything to get our chores done at home. And uh, we'd go into town, and Dad would get a 10-cent block of ice down there across the railroad track. And we'd come home, and they'd milk the cows right quick, 
And in the meantime, my mom was mixing up a freezer of ice cream. And with that dime's worth of ice, we had some of the best country-style homemade ice cream you could ever taste. Uh, but I never will forget, there was a pump at that old Oak Ridge schoolhouse, which has been long gone also. Where was Oak Ridge schoolhouse located? Uh, Oak Ridge schoolhouse was there near the new school that's been built out here on Highway, what is it? Yeah. Yes. But anyway, uh, there was a pump there that you pumped the water. You didn't draw it up out of a bucket. And we'd always beg Dad to stop there and let us get a drink of water because we were so thirsty. And we didn't have a nickel to go down to Mr. Price's drugstore and get us a, a drink, a soda. So we had to do without water or anything to drink. But Dad would never stop at that pump, and I don't know if it's because he thought the ice was going to be melting too fast, or if it was he was wanting to get home to milk these cows, but he never would stop. But I had always wanted to drink some water out of that old hand pump out at Oak Ridge School. You mentioned Mr. Price's drugstore, so when you went to town, on Saturdays, what was the, where were some of the stores that you went to? Oh, goodness, yes. I remember me and my mom walked a long ways, maybe from way up there past Bells, all the way down to Mayhew's, way down below, no, W.W. W. Rankin, at, to buy buttons, because, you know, everybody made the garments, so you had to have buttons. But they had buttons everywhere buttons 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 but one thing i remember there was a vacant lot between old miller drugstore there on main street and mayhew and mcneely's store down there and that's where most people parked their cars and if they had extra produce like corn or cantaloupes or tomatoes and they'd bring them into town and somebody would buy them you know because and that was a good way to get rid of them but in the middle of that vacant lot there was a little building kind of like a little tin building and it was called Ellie's hot dog stand you could smell those hot dogs all over town they were so delicious and I suspect they were a nickel uh, every one you bought was a nickel but anyway uh, Ellie's hot dog stand was a real treat to park right behind it but directly across from Ellie's little shop was the hotel and I never will forget that hotel that had a balcony with big rockers up there and folks would sit up there on that balcony and, of course, watch all of us down here parading around all over more. And that's where you got your news of a new baby or a death or something. You'd see all these different people, and this is how you got your news about. And I heard how the crops were doing, how the crops doing over near the river, where there was supposed to be more water and what have you. And it was just an information center, but I got to tell you a little bit more about that hotel. During the war, my husband was away in the war, and he, he wanted me to call him back at a certain time because he uh, had asked me to marry him, and I hadn't told him. And he gave me kind of a deadline to let him know. Well, in the meantime, these old-fashioned telephones out here in the country went bad. You, we couldn't, I remember our telephone number was a long and three little shorts, you know. And there was about nine people on the line, and you'd hear everybody picking up a receiver to see what was going on. And, and uh, so I couldn't call him at that time, so I went. There was a telephone there in that hotel, and I called him and told him that 
I had decided I would go ahead with the wedding. And so he was happy because he was already getting ready to go overseas. And he says, well, it's, um, it's better to have loved once and lost than never loved at all. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the, 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 the making of the jewelry store. What kind of store was that? Oh, a lot of folks called it the John and Down store. <clears throat> you could buy everything from feed for the cattle to grocers for yourself. Oh, and I remember bolts of fabric up on the shelves, you know, and you'd see it up there. And, the late well everybody had to sew we you know, there were not many bought dresses and things like that and they had uh, most and I actually have seen coops of chickens for sale you'd go there you'd buy a chicken for the weekend well it was alive you had to take it home and kill it and, and fix it Tell us that story or, or about some of the clothes that your mother made you. <laughs> well, uh, we were happy and we were loved. We, I know we were loved by our parents because they sacrificed so much for us. And she made the boys at one time chicken feed came out with uh, beautiful printed fabric, you know, and she could get so many chicken feed sacks the same color, and she's made her some dresses and some aprons out of those chicken feed sacks, and uh, she made the boys their boxer shorts out of some of them, and my daddy, but she made me a pair one time, it was a white flower sack. And she couldn't bleach all the writing off of it. But the back of those underpants was the big word aviation. And I have never forgotten it. And I, I have often wondered if that Mooresville flour mill ever made aviation flour. Probably did. You mentioned that your husband was in the service. I noticed in one of these articles here, when he came home, he brought a bugle with him. Tell now, us something about that bugle. Let me tell you, that was my father, World War I. Okay. My father played the bugle, and, you know, that's before they had any electronics, you know. And uh, he said he had to get up for breakfast and call people to lunch and put them to bed at night. And But it got to be so sad because Dad there were several people approached him uh, and wanted him to play the taps at their father or a dear one's uh, funeral. But he couldn't do it. It just d wouldn't come. In fact, a lady brought a bugle up here from Charlotte and he practiced, and tra but he just could not. He had had a stroke, and but he just could not do it. But Yes, we had that old bugle in our home. It was quite beat up, but I'd give anything now if I had it. Okay, uh, you told us the story about the, uh, the airplane that landed here across the field. Will you relay that story? Because you, you remember that story very well about the airplane. I, I'm not so sh sure if I remember it that well or if I remember reading so much about it. I don't have any way of remembering the year that was. But I do remember when they had this airport out here, and uh, they had little lights all around that. And Mr. Shin himself, he would have to call a report in to Charlotte about the weather and the temperature and all that kind of. So I'm not so sure if I remember that incident from hearsay or or well, well, tell us that story anyway. I know you know I know you know the story. Oh yes. Um there was a Mexican flyer 
uh, flying over Moore's for one night, and it was so foggy. He couldn't see and couldn't find a place to land. So he was uh, flying over Mortal, and it was either Dr. Sloan or Dr. Bell had been out delivering a baby. And he saw that plane that was in distress. So he lined up a bunch of people, and they made a, a line of cars with their lights on, and those that had flashlights directed that plane from Main Street in Mooresville out here to this airport past Prospect Church, and that flyer landed safely. And he was a Mexican flyer, and he was headed, I believe, to Washington or somewhere further north. But he went on and made his trip, and when he came back down this way, he stopped to see the people, you know, and he remembered how how much they had helped in this. That, that was back, according to this article, back in about 1928. So that was before, that was you were a small child then. Yeah, yeah. I would have been four. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us something about uh, uh, the work you did on the farm when you grew up. You mentioned, mentioned to us about the cotton. Oh dear. Uh, this house is built in the middle of a cotton field. My dad said that he would give me uh, some land to build a house on if I'd build here because he realized that if something happened to him that somebody, a daughter needed to be nearby to look after mom next door. Well, we took him up on it. But anyway, as a, a young child, we had cotton on the farm. That was, I guess, the main crop. And we would hoe that cotton, and there would be my mother out there, and my dad would be at public work, and us five kids. So that made quite a, a street down through a field when you get six people hoeing cotton and especially picking cotton. My mother could really pick cotton. She was fast. <clears throat> but you'd pick cotton all day and come to the house and eat supper and get your homework by a lamp. By a lamp. At that time, we didn't have electricity when it first start, come out. And it was hard and eventually the schools started letting the school children out at noontime so they could go home and pick cotton. And that was hard because we got up early to catch the bus and come home and uh, would eat a quick lunch and head to the cotton patch. But it, had, it all had to be picked at a certain time because it was ready. Right. But we always laughed. Um, we'd always take up the peanuts. We always had a peanut patch and a popcorn patch. And we'd take those peanuts up and put them on the roof, wash them, you know, and put them on a tin roof to dry. But we couldn't go start picking cotton until every one of us filled up our pockets with peanuts to eat all afternoon. <laughs> Tell, you mentioned earlier too about uh, Leeser's school. Tell us, tell us something about that. Light school, light school, and it was located down here on the highway one uh, one fifty two, and it was uh, a two room schoolhouse. Miss Ivy Jackson taught. She was Ivy Corral at that time. Uh, taught from first through the third grade. And our little reading circle was little tobacco boxes. Uh, Miss Ivy's husband run a little service station, and he'd buy tobacco in those little wooden boxes. So that's what we went to the reading circle and sat on rather than chairs. 
I remember also our little library. We called it our little library. And it was an orange crate nailed to the wall. And we used the, the cross section as a shelf. And that was all the library books that we had was in that one crate, orange crate that we had nailed to the wall. We did not have water or a toilet at school. Now that's very inconvenient. The, the, the bigger boys in school would get that cooler and go up to the neighbor's house and draw water and fill the cooler so we would have water all day. But we did have an outside john that we could use. And you went to school there in the elementary years? Yeah, uh, they consolidated the Rowan County schools. There was a lot of these little schools. There was one over here at Centenary and one down here at Concordia and then um, Light School. And there were just a lot of little country schools here, there, and yonder. And Rowan County consolidated and took them all. Well, we had to go to Landis. And those other people went to Mount Ella, I think, and places like that. And, and it's the best thing that ever happened. But it's strange how it upset a lot of the parents got because they're taking our school away. They're taking our school away. And, and that was the best thing that ever happened. And in the big room, the teacher was Miss Wilhelm. And she taught 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. And after the 7th, they had to go into a consolidated school before the rest of us went. So, so the children out of here pretty much in the Prospect community went to the life school. Yes. If you lived over in Idle County, you went up there to Oak Ridge. And my mom would get up every day and pack six lunches, imagine. One, every kid had to have their little lunch box, I believe they were. And my daddy went to the mill, and they would, uh, mom and daddy had lots of ham, you know, and a lot of being country people. And we took a lot of ham biscuits to school, and uh, we th thought what a treat it was. Some of our friends at school would trade us a bologna sandwich for that ham biscuit. And we just thought that was the greatest thing, because we hardly knew what bologna was. <laughs> oh, little did you know how we were being treated. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Some of our favorite things to play was hopscotch and jump, uh, uh, jump the plank, you remember, and drop the handkerchief, and uh, Red Rover, Red Rover, and uh, just uh, oh, fly a little bluebird through my window. I don't remember that game. Tell me about that one. Do you remember? Fly a little bluebird. Well, you caught hands and you lift it up, and there was a little bluebird that, and you'd sing, "Fly, little bluebird, in my window, my window." And when we quit singing, wherever the bluebird stopped, that person had to be the bluebird flying in and out the window. We each at home had. Uh, duties that we had to do and everybody knew every day what they had to do and my chore was to keep the wood box filled for the kitchen stove to, for mom to cook and um, so I had to keep and my oldest sister was uh, she had to fill the reservoir on the old wooden cook stove she'd draw water and fill up that reservoir so mom would have warm water in the kitchen and it would keep warm most of the day. So that was, Sarah had to draw it from a, a well bucket 
with a windlass on it. And uh, then the boys always went to the barn to help my dad with the feeding and what. And another little chore was uh, that I had. I had to get in the pots. <laughs> well, if you don't have a bathroom, you have to have a pot up upstairs for all those beds. <laughs> chamber pots. Yeah, chamber pots. Okay. So you had to empty those and bring them in every day. So, how long was it before you actually did, had more modern forgiveness? Oh, um, I would say 1930, something like that. And the reason I can say that um, is a light switch out here in the hall that was in my husband's home and whenever they got electricity one of those boys soldered a 19 and 30 penny on that switch and when they tore down the old house my husband bought that and it's here in our house so if they got it in 1930 it was pretty general at that time you know most most everybody would have it Okay, Ms. Whitney Lear, you have any other stories you'd like to tell us? I know you've got a lot. Can you think of some other stories you'd like to tell us? Well, let's see. I'd like to tell you about working uh, in the molasses field. That was one thing I did not like to do. We Dad would plant a molasses patch every year also. That molasses would grow so rapidly and we had to go out there and what we call strip it and that's taken all the leaves off of and when we finished with it it was just standing straight up but this had to be and then you have to go along with a knife a corn knife they would call and cut it down and stack them in stacks and then a smaller kids had to cut the seeds off the top their little cone of seeds at the top of every uh, cane you know so we had to uh, cut the the seed pods off of the top of that well in the meantime there was a, a dear old black man that lived in the community and he made molasses jim sanders and he moved his equipment and everything down below the barn and he boiled those molasses and cooked those molasses until they were just right and they had a, a horse that went around in circles and circles that were pressing the juice out of that cane molasses cane and there was some person that sat there and fed that stalk into that uh, squeezer or whatever and uh, the juice would just come out and then that juice had to be cooked at a certain temperature and everything to make it just right and old Jim Sanders know just how to do that. Wow, I didn't even know how they made molasses. So they squeezed the, the juice out of the cane and they that's right and and his stove he would it was portable I mean he used bricks and he would say he was way down yonder uh, cooking molasses for another family well he'd load all that up here and build build his uh, little place where he cooked it all and they would be like little trays and he had a little paddle that he stirred them with. What time of the year did he, did you, did you harvest the sugar cane? It was in the fall. In the fall. That's fascinating. 
anything else you think about? Um, let's see. My brothers always enjoyed going to the cotton gin with my dad. We would have to pack the cotton real tight. We'd go down to the cotton house and and all of us would get on the, the wagon and walk, walk, walk and pack it down so Dad would be sure to get enough of the cotton on there to have a nice big bale, which usually run about 500 pounds. And uh, so off they'd go the next morning before daylight. They would have to have their lanterns all clean so they could see good. And the boys thoroughly enjoy it, but it was a long day for them. And they would, that was d during that time when you sell the first bale of cotton, you get your new fall shoes. Because chances are the toes were out of all the others. But anyway, um, there's, um, so, where, so they took you to the cotton gin, and where was the cotton gin located? The cotton gin's located up there uh, beside the flour mill, where the flour mill is now. And uh, uh, Mr. Belk, I think, is the one that owned that cotton gin. And he, um, a big pipe came down and sucked it up out of the wagon and took it through there and took the seeds out. They would bring the seed back home, and they had cotton seed hulls that they fed to the cows when they milked them. And um, they were, you, oh, and I got to tell you that those cotton seeds were stored in a bin in the same, we called it the smokehouse, where they kept all the hams all winter long. But Dad put these seeds up there, and we had to, to pack our mom's canned products in the jars so they wouldn't freeze. We put them up there and packed that, those cotton seeds around them so they wouldn't freeze and burst because she canned hundreds and hundreds of jars every year, blackberries and beans and corn. Well, after all, we it was a big family, seven of us. And when your, when your father and your brothers went to town to take the cotton, you said it was a long day. I'm sure they weren't the only ones that went. No, that was just a special treat. A dad went with them. But I mean, they weren't the only people that went and took their cotton. Oh, no. They learned all sorts of people up there. And, and could, you know, they enjoyed chatting. And, and the cotton wagons lined up for a long way. Right. Uh -huh. Sure were. Way back up there to first and last chance. Do you remember going to first and last chance? Did you ever go there? Yes, I did. Tell us about it. <laughs> well, I don't remember that much except that on the front, as you'd go up the front steps, there was a... I believe it's put out by Michigan, Michigan, some kind of tires. And that little fat man stood there on that little porch at the first and last chance for years and years and years and years. Do they still make that kind of a tire? Yes, they do. Okay, do, do, what were some of the, do you remember anything that you could buy? No, I do not. The only thing I remember it was May Honeycutt, how she would walk. That was her dad, I think, run that first and last chance. And she would walk up there to uh, work. Do, do you remember or have any idea how many bales of cotton you would get from your, your land down here? Uh, I don't really remember, but it would be... Um, I'd say a dozen. They, my dad had what he called a farm loan that they could, these farmers borrowed money to buy their farms. And so this, this money was mainly used to pay for the farm, you see. 
so we didn't have that much luxury from it it was just a matter of holding on to it to pay the bills so, All right, let me ask you the question about the big black iron pot that you remember as the wash pot. Tell us what, what all you used that for. Uh-oh. That, they still, it's still here. Well, I think I still got my husband's is out there, and then one that my mom gave me, and it, she called it Aunt Julie, because it belonged to her aunt. Um, everybody had big old black pots and they especially come in good on wash day because you had to heat your water and then carry it into your washing machine or to your tubs but anyway that was my job every Monday morning was to go fill up the wash pots because mom sure as heck would be washing and poor thing would take her all day to wash with, and then we'd get blisters on her hands and but anyway, um, those pots were had many good reasons. My mom made lye soap, and she'd make that little black pot just full of lye soap. And then when it cut, well, got cold, it was cut in bars. And she used it in the kitchen and different places. Boy, it sure was a, a good cleaner. <laughs> What are the ingredients in lye soap? Red devil eye and grease. Like bacon grease? Yeah. She saved all the grease. And uh, that black part also, at hog killing time, you just could not have hardly enough of hot water at that time. You had to have a pot to be cooking your livers and your everything that you were going to make liver mush out of. And then you had to have a bigger pot to render out the lard, which was just all the fat that was from the hog. And, uh, but it was very important, and it was important that somebody took it as their job to keep wood under those pots to keep the water hot. I say that it was also used with beets. Oh, yeah. We would have a couple bushel of beets every year. And they'd, Mom would cook the beets. You know, you cut the tops off except for about four or five inches. If you don't, all that red color cooks out of the beet, and it's not pretty and red. So you can't. you had to leave about three or four inches at the top. So that made them take up a lot of space in a pot. So that's why we had to use two pots. And uh, and and my folks sometimes got so dirty on the farm that Mom would put their overalls in that black pot and punch them down, you know, to try to get all the dirty dirt out of them. The old red dirt. Yeah. <laughs> I have been uh, going to Prospect Church all these 82 years that I have lived. Uh, I love Prospect Church, and at one time we were the janitors up there. And there again, we had to walk over there to clean the church. My dad was a, a deacon at the time, and they needed somebody to clean up the church periodically. So dad says, yeah, we'll do it. Twelve dollars and fifty cents every three months. Boy, we thought we were getting rich, but anyway, we had to walk over to the church to clean it and to uh, to get by. But I've I have uh, it was during that time that uh, we learned how to earn a little money for work but anyway it was in later years that the church awarded me an honorary life membership 
for all the work I'd done in the church. I had been president of the women of the church. Uh, I've held just about every office there is in the women's work, as well as circle chairman. I've been on several nominating committees for ministers and uh, sung in the choir for all these years and uh, was on the building program for the Children's Educational Building. And there's it, just a lot of things that I've done, but I don't regret the time or the efforts that I put in on it. And with this honorary life membership, that made me uh, appreciate my church and love my church. But most of all, I appreciate God's great love for me when I see the cross and the blood coming down, that wooden cross that was shed for me, that what a life to give. Why should I ever complain about giving anything? so many wonderful stories about your life here on the farm, about Prospect Community, and we so appreciate your, your taking the time to do this. Thank you. I was happy to help you. Thank you.